I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, our speaker today is Jack Kerfoot. And Jack is a scientist, energy expert, uh, author of Healing America, an Insider's Journey. And uh, he's also published and, and, and taken part in a lot of interviews, including with uh, The Hill, uh, a large independent news uh, agency. And uh, we want to ask everyone to uh, stay muted here and type your questions on the chat. And Jack will respond to the questions after the, the uh, presentation. So with that, uh, Jack, take it away. Very good, Mike. The title of this presentation, uh, Oregon's Critical Energy Infrastructure, a uh, multi-billion dollar risk. The objective of this presentation, which I've completely redone since we tried to give it a few weeks ago, is really to provide an overview into the history of the development of the CEI hub, Critical Energy Infrastructure Hub, the routine operational risks with different type of operations that exist there, to assess the risks relative to spill response capabilities and also standards and environmental hazards as well. And finally, we'll conclude with recommendations that ESS are proposing or advocating for to our city and our county. This is a map circa 1912 of the city of Portland. Now we have to realize in night, around this time, the turn of the new century, that it's the birth of the oil industry. In 19, sorry, 1859 was the first commercial oil well. By 1891, the US was producing over 140,000, 149,000 barrels of oil a day. And by 1911, the US was producing 604,000 barrels of oil a day. By 1940, the United States was the dominant oil producer in the world. Now, the reason that's important in 1891, the Port of Houston was established. 1911, during between 1891 and 1911, Companies started building fuel storage tanks across the city. Well, there was a major fire in central Portland, in this area right in here, from a fuel terminal, massive fire, and the fire chief for Portland at the time was killed in the fire. So the city came to the conclusion that fuel terminals need to relocate out of outside a major metropolitan town like Portland. So they moved to London. Well, unfortunately, which is Basically, where they started building is the Critical Energy Infrastructure Hub at that point in time. So in 1915, Portland annexed the town of Linton. And since that time, we've seen numerous companies come in and build and increase the capabilities of fuel storage capacity. McCall Oil, an asphalt plant, Northwest Natural Gas, when they built a liquefied natural gas plant in 1962, New Star and Zenith Energy in 2017. This is an aerial view of a six mile strip of the CEI hub from Northwest St. Helens Road and the West Bank of the Willamette. There are 10 major fuel terminals, diverse highly flammable fuel types, crude oils, ethanol, biofuels, liquefied natural gas, and a variety of refined oils, gasoline, diesels, and aviation. The CEI hub total fuel capacity of liquids is over 360,000, sorry, 360 million gallons and liquefied natural gas equivalent over 64 million gallons of oil equivalent. It contains over 90% of Oregon's fuel storage for the entire state, over 90%. So if there is an environmental hazard or incident on the CEI hub that causes it to be shut down, Transportation in our state will be gridlocked, will be shut down because we won't have adequate fuel supply. Let's take a look at the operating companies and see where they're located. Chevron, Kidder Morgan, Northwest Natural Gas, Zenith Energy, New Star, McCall Oil, Phillips 66, Kidder Morgan, Linton into the north, Equilon, which is really a Shell brand, Pacific Terminal, which is on the same uh, plot of land or site as Northwest Natural Liquefied Natural Gas Plant, 
So totaling over 460 million gallons of fuel oil equivalent. All right, let's take a look at routine operations that are going on there. There's fuels being imported by pipelines from marine vessels onto the fuel storage tanks, marine fuel tankers offloading fuel, railroad car tanks offloading fuels, particularly at the Zenith terminal, natural gas pipeline fueling the LNG terminal. We also have fuel export, marine fuel tankers offloading fuel and tanker trucks transporting fuel from the CEI hub to gas and fuel stations, diesel, gasoline, across the city and the metropolitan area. The CEI hub distance is the crow flies, but what we need to think in terms of is the distance of the blast radius, the blast distance from key fuel terminals to key Portland landmarks. 1,250 feet from the BP terminal to the Linton Park. 4,000 feet from the Chevron terminal to the University of Portland. 8,500 feet from the LNG terminal to the University of Portland. And in an LNG explosion, you talk, you think in terms of a blast radius of 10, 15, and sometimes 20,000 feet. 16,500 feet from Shell to Portland City Hall. We have to realize that we are, have a concentration of fuel storage facilities and terminals with operations of highly flammable fuels in a densely populated area in the United States. Let's take a look at the risks, dual fuel terminal operation, uh, daily fuel terminal operational risk that we've got. Human error, which can't be removed as long as we've got people involved in the terminals. Equipment failures, pipeline leaks, fuel tank ruptures, fuel line leaks, failures. Routine fuel transport, operational risk. We have marine fuel tanker operations, offloading and onloading, collision with other potential marine tankers that we've seen, railroad tank operations, fuel offloading, spill and fire from the rail car derailment. So we now address some analogs to assess and illustrate the risks from routine fuel operations of very small volumes compared to the total fuel capacity in each one of these individual terminals. Let's take a look at an oil pipeline. <clears throat> this is a rupture in pipeline rupture in Michigan. They were importing from Canada diluted bitumen. Now bitumen is heavier than water, so it has to be diluted with benzene, which is a carcinogen. The spill was 830,000 gallons, 70% sank to the bottom, but then the rest of it created a shut down the river for a 25 mile stretch. The river was closed for over two years and partially closed for another four to six years. Total cleanup cost was 1.4 as of 2014. However, current figures say the total cost for cleanup is over $2 billion. What would that look like if we had Zenith Energy resuming operations? They stopped importing diluted bitumen from Alberta in two, two, uh, sorry, 2019 because the price of, of the oil was no longer economic. However, with the oil prices today, those operations are gearing up again and Zenith has the ability to resume those operations. So let's assume just an 830,000 gallon, realizing that Zenith's facilities have over 64 million gallon capacity. So if there is an 830,000 gallon spill into the Willamette, 70% of that would sink to the bottom. We would also see the spill uh, contained to a 25 mile an area along the river in the uh, Willamette and also the Columbia. But more importantly, what we would expect to see is that section of the river closed off. So the Port of Houston would be shut down. We'd see dredging, uh, removal of the bitumen and also to containment of the oil spill for this 25 mile radius. Now there would be another four to six years of partial closure of the Willamette and the Columbia as well. So total cleanup costs would be well over $2 billion considering the number of industrial uh, operations that we have, population that we have here, also the Sovi Island with major farms that are there, this would be a multi, multi-billion dollar uh, catastrophe just from 830,000 gallons of diluted bitumen. And then we have lighter oil. Uh, this was a 2000 rail car explosion, fire and spill. 
2 million gallons of Bakken oil, which is imported or transported by rail from North Dakota, was going over to uh, uh, the maritime of Canada. And there was a derailment of 2 million gallons light fuel. And we have to realize the Bakken is highly flammable. It also has H2S, mercury, and arsenic in it. The train derailed uh, 2,000 blast uh, foot blast radius that basically incinerated everything within that 2,000 foot radius. 47 people were killed. Additionally, even though most of that fuel was in, uh, went up with the explosion, still 26,000 gallons of fuel spilled into the river, contaminating the water supply and the $200 million to clean up the contaminated water and 2.7 billion to rebuild the town. And this is a very small town in Quebec, a few thousand people. And this fire image of the fire was taken about two days, three days after the initial explosion. What would that look like here? Well, we potentially with the type of facilities that we have in Zenith and recognizing it's a much larger facility, we could expect to see a 4,000 foot blast radius, which is a two square mile incineration zone. We would also expect to see 50,000 gallons spill into the river. And the marine life would be killed, groundwater and farmlands contaminated. The contamination uh, cleanup uh, for this and the explosion would be well over five to $10 billion, probably higher. This is a above ground storage diesel tank uh, fire, leak and fire that was in North Dakota. And this, I think, is very important. It was 2018, and a fuel line ruptured that was filling one of these fuel tanks that we see over here. The fire burned for seven hours. The hazardous smoke covered a 50, 50 square mile area. It was only 1,200 gallons of diesel. Now, the key lesson from this in the fire report was that the each of these fuel tanks has a berm around it, which apparently is a standard operating procedure for fuel terminals in the state of North Dakota. I will emphasize this next point that Oregon has no fuel storage tank standards. We're one of the few states that do not. But they saw that these burns mitigate the risk of this fuel spreading and the fire spreading causing uh, fires going to the other fuel terminals. So every terminal, every fuel storage tank had a berm around it. They felt that was a good practice. Well, let's assume Kidder Morgan, which has diesel, their pipeline ruptures carrying diesel, 12,000 gallons of diesel catches fire. But the difference is there are no berms around these tanks. So it would spread. The lack of berms would allow the diesel fire to spread and we would have fires uh, continue to go through the, uh, the the fire and the terminal secondary and term, uh, tertiary explosions. Expect, I'm assuming about a 50% of the fuel capacity would, would catch fire. I'm assuming they're able to quickly contain the fire, which is a very optimistic assumption. The fire would burn for hours and we would see at least a 50 square mile uh, hazardous area. Much of that smoke could easily be toxic. The fires, we're also assuming a best case scenario that the fires do not reach the adjoining Chevron terminal. A limited number of volume of fuels that spill in, uh, into the actual Willamette because the diesel will catch fire. So we're assuming a minimal uh, spillage into the river. So again, although this is a horrible scenario, this is the best case of a horrible scenario and a very small volume. We'll hear a lot about biodiesel, green fuels. Well, Zenith Energy is now proposing to expand their current terminal by another 500,000 gallons for green fuels. Well, let's take a look at green fuels, ethanol. This is a spill in Iowa, 2009, 50,000 gallon uh, uh, spill in, in the ethanol in the river. It's highly flammable. It's it is not heavier than or lighter than oil, so it mixes with water. The EPA is doing additional studies to try and understand the risk of ethanol because in their, stand, in their mind, there is a greater risk of groundwater contamination from ethanol than there is even from oil. 
it's highly toxic to all marine life. And that's why what we see the fish that were over here, there were 58,000 fish, uh, expensive sturgeon. And the fish kill was over $10 million in cost. And of course, there was also contamination to the groundwater and to the water table. So what would that look like if we have Zenith Energy and it begins to import and export biofuels? Let's assume just 50,000 gallons. And of course, they're talking about uh, a volume <laughs> that is more than, well more than 10 times that, that capacity. Fires on the river, all marine life would uh, be killed from Willamette all the way through uh, Columbia, probably all the way to the headwaters of the Pacific or to the Pacific. Sabi Island farm lines would be contaminated, multi-million dollars of damages. Another case in point, another example of operations gone horribly wrong is a liquefied natural gas plant. And we have an LNG plant in the CEI hub, Northwest Natural. This is an example of 1984 LNG LPG explosion in Mexico. But it illustrates, even though it's a small volume, it was an eight inch gas pipeline leaked to a leak in the plant. But the propane and the butane tanks exploded and held small volumes, about 11,000 11, cubic meters, the equivalent of about 72 barrels of oil equivalent, or you can think of in terms of 3,000 uh, gallons of oil equivalent. Uh, from that, which is a very small amount, but again, it's highly pressurized and highly flammable. The blast radius was 16 to 23,000 feet. The estimate was fatalities of 500 uh, 600 people. British uh, BBC, the news network from Britain, estimates the number was over 700. Serious injuries in the thousands. The town was destroyed. Obviously, the terminal was destroyed as well. What would that look like if we had a very small, uh, again, their facility is 64 million gallons of oil equivalent. It's adjacent to the Pacific Petroleum Terminal Storage Tank. Gas leak sets up an LNG plant fire, 3,000 gallons of oil equivalent ex explodes. That's what you're looking at. You'd be talking about a blast and incineration radius going to Lombard Street. Explosion would create fires in the adjacent facility. That's the oil facility. The impact, we would see major blasts, massive fires, fatalities, injuries, two terminals incinerated, oil spills in the river from the Pacific terminal. So if we look at routine fuel operations, they have risks and they are substantial even for small volumes of fuel. Emergency response resources. Fuel terminals, fuel operations, refineries typically have spill response uh, capabilities. Now, the question is, does the CEI hub terminal have adequate emergency response resources? Well, who they use is Clean River Cooperative. And I've talked to the DEQ and they have a very good reputation. They were founded in 1971, nonprofit oil spill removal organization. Six members of the seven terminals or member or associated with the CRC, Clean River Cooperative. McCall Oil, Shell, and Northwest Natural are not CRC members. Now, they use a contractor or CRC subcontracts to NRC, National Response Corporation, founded in 1992, the largest commercial spill response organization in the world. It is an excellent reputation in the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea and West Africa and Southeast Asia. The oil spills hazard, high hazard emergency, environmental, industrial, and firefighting. So the question is, is the Clean River Cooperative prepared for a multi-million gallon fuel uh, catastrophe? Well, diving into the CRC technical manual, as I tend to do, when you look at the fact that their equipment was used uh, in their operations is designed for freshwater Columbia River, Willamette River, which is excellent. That's exactly what you want to a spill response to freshwater restricted areas and rivers is very different and more difficult than in open water marine areas such as the Gulf of Alaska or the Gulf of Valdez uh, or the uh, Valdez uh, fire and spill from Exxon and the British Petroleum uh, uncontrolled flow or blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, the Macondo. 
But they're worst case scenarios. So when you design these plans, you need to look at a range of outcomes. What is the minimum case and what is the maximum case? Well, their maximum case, worst case, is 300,000 barrels, which is 12.6 million gallons. And yet we know that the liquid fuel capacity is over 340 million gallon capacity from the CEI terminal, hub terminal. So Clean River Cooperative's worst case spill response equipment is inadequate for a multi-million gallon fuel spill at the hub. So what we see now is that we've got risk with routine operations and we see the emergency response resources are inadequate for the CEI hub. What about natural disasters? Flooding, earthquakes, severe weather. What is that type of risk? And is the CEI hub at risk from a natural disaster? Well, this is a map, in the top left-hand corner of what they call a GEO, a mitigation action plan, liquefaction and susceptibility. And what it is, is they're identifying in the red and dark red areas, high-risk geo hazard zones. And that happens to coincide with the CEI hub. A liquefaction zone is basically loosely packed, usually high clay content sediments near the ground sur surface that loses structure and structural integrity when there is shaking, shaking from an earthquake, from an aftershock, from an explosion. Volcanic eruption, for instance, the Mount St. Helens was a 5.4 magnitude uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. What happens is the the earth can't support buildings or fuel tanks, so gas lines would leak, fuel storage tanks would rupture, rail cars would uh, tip over, and fuel would spill, high probability of spills, fires. Fuel storage tanks within 500 feet of the river, there would be very high probability, almost a certainty of fuel spills into the Willamette River. Moderate fills, uh, spills would still extend for tens of miles and be catastrophic. This is sort of top left is a image from USGS talking about earthquake liquefaction. When they talk about stable soil and liquefied soil, what we see is those structures simply just tip over or disintegrate. This is an example in Japan. These buildings are 60, 70 feet in height, had substantial structural foundation, unlike a fuel storage tank, which has no structural foundation. It's just sitting there on the open ground. So uh, those would easily collapse and creating massive spills and a high probability of fire. So a study that the county of Multnomah did, prepared by Hart Krauser, and this is the uh, uh, draft, was, the last draft I saw was August of 2021, looked at the, the, big, the big one, like the OPB study that they talked about, a major earthquake off the cascade subduction zone that would be a magnitude eight or nine. And so the question is, what would be the impact on the CEI hub? Well, the first thing they did was to identify terminals, which we have seen before. And they noted that there are 630 petroleum storage tanks in all these different terminals. And over 60% were built before 1993. In their mind, those are structurally high risk tanks. In any major earthquake, there would be 100% failure of those tanks. So any fuel, partially filled or filled to the top, would rupture. And obviously, with the capacity, we'd be talking about major uh, spills. In fact, when they looked at just the liquid spills, the most likely outcome they had was a 40 to 82 million gallon of fuel spilled into the Willamette River. And after three days, 18 to 37 million gallons of petroleum would still be in the Willamette River. That's a critical, because if you're trying to clean up the river, time is critical. You have to get there and contain the spill and start removing the oil as quickly as possible. The longer you wait, the longer the delay, the more uh, impact, negative impact it has to the, to the water table and to the environment. CRC's worst case, if we think back, is spill response equipment, is only 15 to 31% of the forecast spillage in this report. So again, emphasizing spill response capabilities for the CEI hub are inadequate. 
So we now see that there's high risk for natural disasters from earthquakes, but there's also risks associated with severe weather. Interestingly enough, if we look globally, one of the major causes of fires in many fuel terminals are actually lightning strikes and also areas with flooding or high water, like the Pacific Northwest, also have risks from that as well, especially along the river like the CEI hub is. But what about fuel tank standards? I've mentioned that we really don't have any fuel tank standards, but let me go into that. And are our standards that we have for flammable fuel tank facilities adequate? This is an aerial view of the terminals and the fuel tank standards. Oregon puts all of the fuel standards right now underneath the fire marshal. We're one of the few states in the US that has that approach. States like California, Oklahoma, Texas, Washington, Louisiana, North Dakota, Wyoming and Colorado have it under the EPA or their state EPA. The CEA hub above ground storage tanks, ASTs, that they're saying, and that's what we talk about this, this would be an AST, that over 60% were built before 1993, which means that they are a high structural risk. They are also closely spaced, which means that if there is a fire, that there is a very high probability that fire will spread and explosions will spread very quickly and very rapidly. Equally, only the McCall terminal, which is this one right here, has a berm. Now, standards in most states is that each large tank has a berm around it. McCall at least has a berm, but it's around the entire facility. Diverse fuel types, whether it's crude oils from the tar sands or light oils or refined petroleums or biofuels, makes fire suppression very difficult. Additionally, not only do we have the risk with the current status of the operations today, we have Zenith Energy and other companies that are talking about expanding the capacity of their fuel terminals, which would have further, as you increase the spacing or the concentration of these fuel storage tanks, you only increase, increase the risk of catastrophic outcome. All right, routine fuel terminal operations, they are our risks. We have seen the emergency response resources are inadequate. We have seen natural disasters. There's a high risk in the CEI hub, and we have seen Oregon standards for fuel terminals are inadequate. All right, we've got to recognize that over 90% of all liquid fuels in Oregon are stored in the hub. Multiple causes for catastrophe, human error, pipeline leaks, equipment failures, natural disaster. One catastrophic event would devastate Portland and Oregon. We would be without fuel for aviation fuel, <laughs> trucks, planes, cars, marine transport. Transportation would grind to a halt. We're also talking about risks of explosion, fatalities, and serious injuries and devastating contamination for the groundwater and for the farmlands around you. Many of these oils, like diluted bitumen, contain carcinogens, which means that a spill would re ultimately mean that you would expect to see, like you see in certain parts of the Mississippi, like in Louisiana, an increase in cancer. Inadequate fuel terminal standards increase the risk of hub catastrophe. Insufficient emergency response resources increase the impact of the catastrophe. And increasing fuel prices will encourage more and more companies to expand the CEI hub operations. All right, so refined petroleum and biofuels are essential to Portland. We all are supportive of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But to be candid, that will take time. So what we have to ensure is that we don't have a catastrophe as we transition from fossil fuels to a greener grid or a greener fuel source. The location, not only is a geohazard, but also the spacing and the standards are inadequate, puts the whole hub at risk. Environmental uh, catastrophe would devastate the city. Engineers for Sustainable Future, ESF. We advocate for increasing Department of Environmental Quality oversight over all state fuel terminals, reducing total fuel capacity at the CEI hub, 
<coughs> relocate the LNG terminal outside of the city, ensure fuel security for Portland and Oregon, legislate prudent state, county, and city fuel terminal standards, including seismic vulnerability study, fuel terminal st standards, <coughs> including spacing and berms, strict financial criteria or bond for terminal operators. Zenith Energy is a LLC that is a foreign owned company and could simply walk away if there was any spill. Absolutely require sufficient emergency response resources for a real worst case uh, CEI hub catastrophe and establish health safety environmental certification standards for all terminal operators. The Oregon legislature started in February of this year, Bill 1567, fuel storage seismic vulnerability was proposed, uh, sponsored by Senators Dimbro, Manning, and Frederick, also represented Evans, Graybar, Plum, and Dexter. It's a design to mandate that fuel terminals of over 2 million gallons or storage facilities with over 2 million gallons conduct a seismic vulnerability standard and, this, and the report must be uh, submitted to and approved by the DEQ. Uh, and then the Department of Energy to develop an energy security plan. You know, the ESF supports, uh, has given supportive testimony uh, to SB 1567, and we were asked to provide technical support uh, by questions that were raised by the Western States Petroleum Association. And uh, obviously, we answered their questions because in the Senate vote, it was 29 for yes, no votes for no. One person was not present. So it was a bipartisan, uh, overwhelming majority for this bill. It now goes to the House and then hopefully to the governor. All right, now let's take a look at the hierarchy for approval. The hierarchy is first the federal government sets standards Coast Guard, Department of Energy, Bureau of Land. The states can increase those federal standards, but they can't reduce them. The county can increase the state standards, but they can't reduce the state standard. And the city can increase the county standard, but can't reduce it. So our Multnomah County and the city of Portland have the authority to implement or legislate additional requirements or standards for the CEI hub. Let's start with the fact that it represents a major safety, environmental, and economic risk to the city of Portland. So located in the hazard geohazard zone, 400 million gallons of volatile flammable fuels within a major city. ESF, we advocate for city and county governments to enact fuel terminal standards to mitigate risks, including all term, uh, tanks be built after 1993. All ASTs must have berms around them as per EPA specifications. As the picture in the lower right hand is an example. Each terminal must conduct soil testing for mercury, arsenic, lead, and other toxic chemicals. Because if the soil is contaminated, that means more than likely these toxic chemicals are leaching into the river. City and county governments can enact emergency response standards they should enact emergency response standards. We have to make sure there are adequate resources to address a major spill, especially for a concentrated area like the CEI hub. All terminal operators must join an approved oil spill response organization. Approved OSR oils must have response uh, resources to uh, respond to at least an 82.5 million gallon fuel spill. And we'd also advocate for Portland enacting a $1 a gallon tax on fuels exported out of state by fuel tankers. Zenith is looking to increase their terminal for one reason and one reason oil only, and that is to be a major fuel tank, uh, fuel exporting center for the West Coast or for Asia. Uh, and so they want to bring in fuel from Canada, from North Dakota, biofuels from Iowa, and start exporting it on the Willamette and the Columbia River, which we see as a major risk, and we oppose that position. So thank you very much. If there are questions, let's see. Let me go to chat. Go to the top. Um,
chart uh, 10 correctly depicts <laughs> University of Portland directly across from the river with possible zenith blast. That's exactly right. Uh, and, and we're talking and not just about a blast, but potential incineration from an LNG. Um, do you have an LNG explosion to compare to? Is LNG as potentially explosive as LPG? The answer is yes, uh, but the real question is not just the particular type of fuel, but it's the volume of fuel. If you had the 63 million capacity, or let's say an LNG facility of half of that with an explosion, you would see an explosion far greater than what we saw from the example of the butane and the propane, okay? So the answer is, uh, I, I didn't have one, but I will tell you when you design liquefied natural gas terminals, you talk about two areas. The first area is the incineration zone of the LNG tanker. And the second is the incineration zone of the uh, fuel terminal itself. And then you talk about the blast rates and you talk about how many square miles are incinerated and how many dozens of square miles of buildings are just leveled. So uh, the answer is what I showed you would be far greater uh, the capacity at the Northwest Natural would be far greater than what you're actually seeing uh, from the example in Mexico. Update in Multnomah. Oh, someone was kind enough to provide the latest updated one. Thank you very much. Uh, Northwest Natural, 7 million gallon LNG tank alone, left the, okay. All right, thank you. Uh, to so well, I'm not sure I agree with self-regulation. Uh, also passed the house, that's good. Uh, the berm uh, clearly could not contain a, a full tank of leak. Are there standards to have berms uh, capable to capture uh, a typical spill? The EPA, the US Environmental Protection Agency, the federal agency, they look at the actual size of the burn of the tank itself, and they look at the amount of, now all of those tanks may be large, but they're not always filled to capacity. So it will depend on that standpoint. But the idea is to mitigate the risk, dramatical risk of a spill. So. If we go, the fallback is to a US EPA standard. It may not be the perfect answer, but it's certainly a better answer than what we have today. Uh, biodiesel, not ethanol, any reason for bias? No. Uh, uh, and the contamination is just as bad into the water. No, uh, unfortunately, uh, biodiesel uh, uh, is not a, a good outcome as well. I could have found some biodiesel examples of fires and explosions, uh, but I didn't want to turn this into a three-day presentation of fires and explosions from fossil fuels and biofuels over the last 10 years. Um, do we have a sense of probability of these extreme events? Now, the OPB study uh, video that was done several years ago, what they talk about is some they talk about time frames, And again, what you're doing as a GFS is you measure the movement along these subduction zones and you measure the frequency of the earthquake and the intensity of the earthquake. So they talk about a range, they talk about a 30 year window, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from that standpoint. So do they have a precise date? Unfortunately, like most things in science, we can't give you time and hour and date. We can talk about a window of so What they were talking about is a major magnitude eight to nine occurring between the next 10 to 30 years. Now, the largest earthquake on record that I'm aware of is off Chile, that was an 8.7 that completely devastated uh, the coastal region along Chile and most of the cities in that area. Uh, we're further away from those cities, but at the end of the day, there would be devastation. And that's what that report was really designed to address. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions. So I am going to try and exit. All right, Mike, you wanna take over? Thank you, Jack. Uh, appreciate your efforts and the tremendous amount of studying that you've done and your knowledge of the years of working with uh, you know, all, all over the world with the oil fossil fuel industry is being put together, put 
put to good use here. It's much appreciated. And anyone who has a desire to have a, a, a one, hour, one hour credit for professional engineering, uh, please email me, Mike Unger at Comcast.net. Yeah. Mike, I would make one more comment as well. <clears throat> when I was putting this together, I contacted <clears throat> friends of mine that are with companies around the world from Japan, Mitsui, Mitsubishi, that have operations in LNG and fuel, fossil fuel in Taiwan, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in the United Kingdom, in the Netherlands, in Spain, in Italy, in the Middle East. And no one could tell me of, they were stunned to hear that was about the CEI hub, the concentration of the fuel storage and in a major metropolitan area, their comment is, it's not if there's going to be a catastrophe, it's only when. So from their standpoint, they were absolutely shocked that the city has allowed this to continue on. I have a question, Jack. Sure. Um, with some of the larger tanks, if you had an explosion, um, my understanding of um, sandy soils is that that imposes a seismic shock that can propagate. That's correct. So uh, could you uh, reflect on for a minute or so on the possibility of uh, chain effects? Well, that's what I talked about when we talk about earthquake liquefaction, what's your, it could be caused by an earthquake, it could be caused by an aftershock, it could be caused by an explosion. It depends on the type of seismic wave. And in this case, more than likely, it would be what we would call a, a ground roll or more than likely a shear wave. And that actually is a higher risk type of energy through passing through the soil. So the probability of that uh, creating tank failures or uh, in other facilities away from the site would also be uh, a likely outcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Jack. Good. Much appreciated. Good day, everybody. Thank you very much.